Hey everybody, it's Heather from One to One Physical Therapy and thank you so much for tuning in. I am super excited to be talking about how physical therapists and dentists can integrate and work together. Um, I find that without some dentists in my life, we I would not be able to progress and help a lot of my patients. So I'm really hoping that this talk helps to bring awareness from each side of the profession, from physical therapists and dentists, on the impact that the work that we do has and affects the other, um, and also how we can work together and communicate. So let's get started. And I would say the overall goal would be to think about the concept of neutrality um, between the whole body, and that's the postural system, the bite, um, the dentist would refer this to as the occlusion, um, and any appliance therapy or orthodontia process going on. We want all of this to be in harmony with one another. And from the physical therapist's um, role, we want to create a neutral postural system to ultimately accept the, the bite, the occlusal, the occlusal pattern, any appliance um, adjustment that was made, and if the postural system outside of the bite is not neutral, it will make it more difficult for the appliance therapy or an orthodontic process to progress. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later in more detail. And from the dentist's position, they are trying to facilitate an occlusal pattern, uh, appliance, um, an adjustment that promotes neutrality throughout the TMJ. And dentists use the term centric and occlusal relation. And centric relation basically means neutrality and alignment of the TMJ, where the condyle is positioned in the fossa. And occlusal is more about how the teeth um, interact and are related to each other. And essentially, if there is an adjustment made or if there is a bite pattern that's not ideal, the body will tighten up in response to this. And ultimately, that can make it more difficult um, for all parties, really. The dentists, in terms of their ability to progress and also for the physical therapist. So these scenarios work both ways. So let's talk a little bit more about what postural neutrality means. And I like to look at this in two broad categories from a physical perspective, and that's skeletal neutrality and neuromuscular neutrality. Skeletal alignment um, is basically the alignment of our bones and our joints and making sure they're as symmetrical as possible and basically on axis. A good analogy would be like a car. You want your car alignment on axis and if it's not it might you know veer off to one side or the other. From a dental perspective, we sort of already talked about this, was the concept of centric um, relation and occlusion. And again, that's the alignment of the jaw joint and the teeth. And ideally that is in balance. But let's talk about neuromuscular alignment, which is essentially the balance between opposing muscle groups, agonist, antagonist muscle groups, and that there's 
there's good tension between them. There's no excessive tension in one area. There's no weakening, lengthening in the other. So in the physical therapy world, we talk a lot about length, tension relationships. Um, you know, for the dentist listening to this, this would be um, applicable to if you were doing EMG analysis and looking at EMG activity of the muscles of the TMJ and the neck, and ultimately you're trying to create balance there. And these two um, aspects of the skeletal and the neuromuscular, they're interdependent and they, they influence one another. For example, for our skeletal um, influencing our neuromuscular, structurally, if we have a narrow and retruded palate, what that can do is it can trap the mandible, the jaw, and keep it in a um, retruded posterior position, which affects the occlusion and it affects the, the muscles because the tension and the length of the muscles get altered because of the inherent architecture that it is on. And likewise, if you have neuromuscular influences such as increased tension, you're going to then have malalignment, um, you know, at the cervical spine, the TMJ, the cranial system. So they work both ways, but I would say that we have to consider what is kind of really at play here with regards to our posture and what's control what's really controlling what so the position of our bones are ultimately controlled by our muscles which are ultimately controlled by our autonomic and central nervous systems and as i said before in the example that if you have particular structural features you will have certain neuromuscular features but really what's at play here many times is the neuromuscular system and how it is basically uh, it's like puppeteering the skeletal system and the alignment and the structure so if we want to create change we really need to consider what's happening at the neuromuscular level. And this often requires active therapeutic activities and techniques to create change. And that usually passive, manual, or sensory techniques in isolation although they can support this process, are not necessarily going to create as much of a permanent carryover. So for example, I can say that if you can perform joint mobilization on the TMJ all day to try to shift that into its proper position, but if you do not address the neuromuscular patterns, it is very unlikely that it's going to stay. And furthermore, not only do we need to consider the neuromuscular function specifically related to the jaw, the cranium, and the neck, but we also need to look below because everything is influencing the other. You know, you, you can switch one domino and it'll just create this cascade of change in either direction. Because ultimately the body works in patterns. Everything is coupled with one another. So I could assess somebody's neck and I could tell you based on what I'm finding at the neck what's going on at their hip, and likely what's going on at their jaw. <clears throat> so
So the art and the science of this is really figuring out where the kinks are. Um, you know, we can create, I've, I've created changes in cants and jaw midlines by not even touching the jaw, but just working at the pelvis and the hip. Um, and again, sometimes this will immediately translate above and sometimes it might not. And then it's about, okay, where else do we need to work in the system to create the shifts? And it, and it really depends on the person. So I'm going to show you an example of what a rib cage, um, an active rib cage mobilization, what that means is breathing, active breathing was coupled with this. What it did to cervical and cranial um, skeletal alignment. So if you look at the picture on the left, the pretreatment, compared to the picture on the right, you will see that the one on the right, there is a significant more um, posterior cranial rotation. So it's more of a forward head posture. Um, there's more compression at um, the CO, C1, C2, the subcranial area relative to over here, so there's more space. You can see the change in the, um, the base of the cranium over here. This is the top of the maxilla, so you can see that angulation. But I also want you to look at right over here, you see this, um, it kind of looks like a, this is basically the jaw um, because it was not on the on the frontal plane, it was not equal, you can see how it becomes more balanced from a side-to-side -side perspective. And if we look at this from um, an anterior-posterior view, you can see in the, the pretreatment the alignment of the head relative to the neck was really off to the side. And if you look at it post-treatment, there's much more equality here. And I want you to look at the dens. Here's the dens. And it's off to the side. It's rotated pre-treatment. And after treatment, it is more midline. So I was really fortunate in this situation to have the opportunity to, t to have these um, scans done before and immediately after we did this treatment. And all of this changed by just working on the rib cage. And the technique took maybe just a couple minutes. And we also got some shots of her leg flexibility. So look at the tension. This is that neuromuscular tension in the system that changed before and after this technique. So this is the left side and this is the right side. So this brings up the question of, so from a dental perspective, which which postural system would you um, rather equilibrate an appliance in? So would you like your patient to come in and balance an appliance when they're in this position or in this position? Now, ultimately the appliance is trying to create this, but we want it matched up. So almost in a way by creating this neutrality from the start and then going in and performing an adjustment you're matching up neutrality and alignment at the neck and also elsewhere in the body with the bite 
So this is a really critical concept that um, I would love physical therapists and dentists to be on the same page with, and that is matching, matching up the neutrality. So that again, what's going on up here is matching up here in a pattern because these things typically don't happen in isolation. When you change one, you affect the other. So on the other hand too, if a dentist is performing an, an adjustment, they're equilibrating an appliance, and the result is the postural system is tightening up and, and getting more tense, you, you're sort of, you, ideally you don't want that to happen. And you're creating that, a mismatch. So one way to look, another way to look at this too is so say your pa say your patient is coming in for orthodontia and you're working to create that beautiful skeletal um, alignment equilibrium there's you've got some centric relation the occlusion looks great but if that was done matched up to a postural system that is not neutral, in a way you're just, you're, you can be reinforcing that pattern throughout the rest of the body. And you can create areas of increased tension anywhere else if it's not all neutral together. And the other aspect of this too is that if, if an appliance or an ortho or a bite is creating more tension in the system, that increased neuromuscular tension is actually going to make it harder for the orthodontic process or appliance therapy process to progress. And that's because of the influence of the neuromuscular tension on the movement on the symmetry of the cranial system, including the palate and the midline of the jaw. So if there's, if there's increased tension in the temporalis, in the masseter, in the pterygoids, all of that is going to create um, more difficulty with allowing that cranial system to shift, to expand. Okay, so from the physical therapy perspective, it's our role to facilitate this neuromuscular function. We want to create neutrality, and we really need to work with our dentists, particularly when we have patients whose bites are negatively impacting the tension in their system and the neutrality. And likewise, we want to rely on our dentists to create that balance, that centric relation and occlusion to harmonize with the rest of the postural system. And I just want to make a note that you know, there are cases sometimes when an adjustment may result in increased tension in the system, but it kind of just has to because of getting to a long-term goal. Um, so I myself have gone through oral appliance therapy, and I went through a phase where the appliance created an anterior open bite in order to shift my, um, to open up my maxilla more forward. And, you know, my system tightened up a little bit more 
during this time. And uh, it was, and then eventually it closed and things were okay. So it was part, I under, we understand that it's part of the process sometimes to go through that, but ideally we want to minimize tension in the system. And just to talk a little bit about the midline of a bike, because this is sort of a, an important concept um, for both PTs and dentists, because we, you know, we cross at the, at the TMJ. Um, so a lot of times that midline is related to the mandible not being aligned on the temporal bones. However, it's really the temporal bones that aren't aligned on the mandible. And the influences on those temporal bones, they go all the way down the body to the feet. So again, you can look at this change in midline by just working at the rib cage. And there's so much going on that could be influencing that midline besides just the bite. Um, and um, we really want to look at all the different influences and harmonize it. So from a clinical perspective, let's just talk about how we assess neutrality. And at our clinic, we are, we're a postural restoration certified center. So for those that are familiar with the Postural Restoration Institute, you'll be very con familiar with the concept of neutrality, but we look at range of motion, not just from a perspective of like a flexibility of a joint or the range of a joint, but depending on how much range is there, the nature and the quality, it's really telling us the alignment and the axis. So when a pelvis or a shoulder or a temporal bone is not in the right position, the joint is not free to fully move. So we are getting a lot of information when we do these, what could be construed as very simple tests. But by looking at these patterns of restriction, we can determine alignment of the skeletal system as well as what's going on in the neuromuscular system. And for dentists, they will look at neutrality and alignment. You know, if they're looking at the bite, they will look at, um, use contact paper to see um, if there's equal distribution of contact points. They'll do scans and um, to look at the alignment. They could do EMG analysis to determine if the neck muscles are firing. This would be their, their tool for looking at more neuromuscular neutrality. And the dentist just needs to ask the question, is this patient's postural system limiting their ability to reach to achieve centric relation occlusion. Um, you know, am I being, is this person's progress being limited because of the rest of their postural system? And likewise, physical therapists need to ask, is the bite limiting my ability to help my patient achieve neutrality throughout their postural system. And there's some kind of fun ways to test from a physical therapy standpoint if you need to get a dentist involved. And I'm gonna go through those, but I do wanna just touch base on the nature of the bite and the teeth. 
Traditionally, we look at the bite as a very structural, skeletal um, structure. And it is, but it's also incredibly sensory. There are a lot of different um, afferentation nerve fibers in the teeth and teeth are proprioceptive. So they actually tell us, they tell us particularly where our head and neck are in space. So patients that tend to clench and grind, traditionally we tend to think of that as stress or their airway isn't open, but it could be that they really have trouble knowing where they are in space and have postural issues and they're compensating by clenching and grinding because it's giving them this um, sensory input. It's soothing. And when we make changes to the bite, we're not only just changing structure, but you're changing contact. You're changing different patterns of afferent information that are going from the teeth to the brain to the autonomic nervous system which is then going to have an efferent effect on the nervous system and respond. So these little tricks and tools that we as physical therapists can do to test if a bite is influencing the body I want you to think of them as not just structural or as adding more vertical dimension or adding more buildup on one side. Yes, that's happening, but it's a sensory piece as well. And uh, my colleagues and I, we did uh, another video where we actually are demonstrating this, and I would um, encourage you to reference that video. But basically, what we will use right over here is a bite plate and you can get this pretty inexpensive i think we order it from patterson Dent dental this is a tongue depressor so we will take a baseline test of a patient's um, neutrality status by looking at their range of motion at their neck their shoulder their pelvis and their hip and then we will place either the bite plate, a tongue depressor. And we, we may put the tongue depressor on one side or both sides, and we wanna see the response of the postural system. Does the body positively respond? And does the range of motion change? Do, do we get more neutral? We might also do some manual expansion at the palate and this provides some sensory stimulation. We're also you know, mechanically mobilizing the palate to determine how the body responds to that. And this, this is a good test to see if somebody is a candidate for an expansion-based oral appliance therapy. And we also will sometimes use um, muscle testing, applied kinesiology techniques, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but we'll also use that to test for different um, you know, options in the, in the bite to see if we need to get a dentist involved. And we, this also is applicable for testing a patient's current appliance. Um, you know, so a lot of people that we come in to evaluate, they may already be in an appliance or a night guard, and we'll have them bring it in. We'll take a baseline testing, put the appliance in, and see how their body responds. Does it tighten up or does it loosen up? Because um, that gives us really valuable information of what that appliance is doing for the system. So essentially, 
if the postural system tightens up, um, it's, it's not a desirable outcome. And it's going to make it more difficult um, for things to, pro to progress. You know, as I said before, there might be cases where that can happen. Now, there also can be a situation where a dentist may perform an adjustment and it might restore um, neutrality in one area, but not in another area. And it may actually be that that other part of the body needs a physical therapy intervention to address. So again, to harmonize with the whole system. So it's all about creating, um, you know, a, a harmonious neutrality throughout the whole body. So what's cool here is because the PT, because we can potentially provide this feedback about the reaction of the body to an appliance, um, to an adjustment by a dentist, the dentist can use this information and they can use it to help direct their treatment. So there's a, you know, a wide variety of different approaches from dentists doing different types of splints and oral appliances and orthodontia, but whatever your approach is, if you are working with a physical therapist and you can get this feedback as to how your appliance is affecting the body, it can really be helpful in, in your process in how you're going to um, you know, do your adjustments. So we've had some cases working with um, dentists where we've given them just a little feedback where we say, no, it seems that when they have more contact on one side, their body likes it and the dentist can, you know, make an adjustment accordingly. So it's just more data and input and um, really this is what it's all about when we're working together. <clears throat> And likewise, for the physical therapists out there, you may not be able to help your patient meet their goals unless you get a dentist involved. So you, you might be stuck and this could be the missing piece. So you could achieve potentially more, a better outcome with your patient if you consider this part of the body and this other profession to, to ally with. So at our clinic, we use quite a variety of modalities and techniques to facilitate postural neutrality and to train the postural system to harmonize with the bite. And I'm just going to briefly go through through, through some of them. Um, postural restoration. So PRI, the Postural Restoration Institute, uh, I said we, we're a certified center. And I've, I've been a physical therapist for 18 years now. And I've been doing PRI for seven or eight years. And I will say that I have found this to be um, this approach to be absolutely essential um, for getting the best patient outcomes possible. Um, and actually, the the founder of the institute, Ron Hareska, he was in dental school for three or four years before he went to physical therapy school. So there is a really big um, component and philosophy behind this approach about the connection between 
the bite, and the rest of the body. And it's a, there's a very active neurosensory training element involved. And the Institute has three advanced level classes focused on the cervical cranial occlusal system. And there's been many dentists that have taken these and I encourage dentists to take these classes. I mean, they're rooted in the pioneers of physical therapists and approaches that deal with the bite and the TMJ, such as Mariano Roccobato and osteopathic medicine. Um, but in, from my perspective, it takes it uh, light years beyond and into the future of how we want our professions to work together and to look at the body in a really holistic perspective. We will integrate myofunctional therapy to train appropriate tongue posture, swallowing, chewing, reflex and sensory integration. This is really important. Um, the, the Muscatova Neurosensory Reflex Integration, MNRI, is the primary approach that we use, but there's so much overlap with manual therapy and sensory integration. Um, I actually think manual therapy is often given, all, given credit that it's creating all this mechanical change and release but I, I actually think it's more of a sensory change and uh, that there's more sensory integration going on in manual therapy that is given credit for. So the, this uses very specific techniques. There's specific oral facial techniques. Um, we do an entire oral facial protocol that takes about an hour to do that is very effective um, at getting the craniofacial system um, more neutral and balanced. Uh, manual therapy, I've already gone through that a bit in terms of the sensory elements and how really we have to pair it with an active approach. But some of the manual techniques that we do are craniosacral therapy, myofascial release, cupping, gua sha, we do nasal release technique where we will insert uh, a small balloon up into the nasal passage, inflate. And this, um, it does a great job of opening up. This actually has a really good mechanical influence. Um, the sphenoid, the palate, it kind of gives a good mobilization there. Um, it's great for people that have had concussion and trauma to their face. We really respect the integration and the connection between the mind and the body and how powerful underlying beliefs and mental and emotional patterns and perceptions have on the physical body. Uh, one of our therapists here is trained in hypnotherapy and we will often integrate guided imagery and breathing with our um, physical exercises and um, manual therapy techniques. Nutrition, you know, when we have persistent pain and inflammation, we really have to consider the physiological elements that may be involved. And this is when we might go down a nutritional route and give some support and guidance there. And in addition to our physical body, we also have an energy field associated with it, and that's our biofield. And we will use sound and light. Um, we'll use tuning forks, cold laser. We also might use a technology called microcurrent, which combines um, low-level current at specific frequencies and these are all to support us at a 
energetic level, but also a cellular level as well. And so in conclusion, um, you know, we want to work together. Um, physical therapists and dentists, there's so much potential for us to help our patients. And by keeping the goal of system-wide neutrality, uh, skeletal, musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, neurological, whole system neutrality, and the impact that what we do has on the other parts of the body. And um, by being able to communicate that and um, just learn from each other. So I, um, I hope that this can help other physical therapists and dentists out there uh, to work together and to recognize the power that we have as a team. And thank you so much for listening. And I will see you around. Bye.